and he would take the wire and strip it and then collect and collect and collect it and go down and then trade it in for money for parts. Now we know we got some more uh, old car lovers, Pastor Wilson, in here. So he would trade it in the parts, and then it took some years to get it done, because sometimes my dad would try to hide, uh, <clears throat> try to hide the purchase of some of the materials, because it was. <laughs> he didn't tell mom every time he bought something, it got in the mail. Well, they finally got it done after some years. And can you bring the picture up? It was totally restored. Beautiful. Now, my dad brought it down to Norfolk, Virginia one time, and he got a hard time for this because he put it on a trailer and he drove his 57 Chevy down with a Ford pulling it. Now, I give him a little hard time for that one. But Pastor Thomas remembers that. He, we, we came to the church, and Pastor Thomas so graciously let him park it in our church property because it had a fence, and he felt very comfortable about that. And so we came in the back of the church one day and we was cleaning and polishing and all that. And one day I took it to work and I pulled in at work with it. Told everybody, I told you it was getting 57 Chevy. And he says, don't lie to us. That's your dad's. So they knew. The title of the message today, Non-Negotiables of Our Christian Faith. That car was non-negotiable. If somebody would have come and asked my dad, he's like, you know what? I'm going to give you a lot of money for that car. He's going to say this. It's not for sale. You ever hear anybody say that? It's not for sale. You may have said it. Have you said that before? About anything? It's not for sale. That car was not for sale. And I called my brother and said, and he got it passed down to my brother, which rightly so. He helped him restore it and helped him work on it. And my brother still takes it to car shows. That's was parked in my brother's house in Ohio. That's uh, so Thomas's lovely state, Ohio, but right beside the, uh, the greatest state of West Virginia. No offense, Pastor Thomas. None taken. I, I, I want to share some things that we may have heard before. I should have never given that up. You ever, you ever say that? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I should have not given that up. That means you gave something away you shouldn't give up. Or how about this one? Or this is priceless to me. Ever hear that one? This is priceless. You know what? I, um, I saw an article one time. This lady had a vase. And, you know, what's that show? The Antique Roadshow? And I remember she brought it to the Antique <clears throat> Road Show. And the guy says, I don't think you know what you have. And she says, well, you know, I was just trying to brought it here to, you know, to see what, you know, the price was. And he says, ma'am, this thing is priceless. He says, this thing should be in a museum. <laughs> you know, I mean, not, not in your house. This thing should be in a museum where people could see it. And sometimes we hold things that is priceless. We don't even understand and realize it. And I'm here to encourage us. Though you can't see your soul, though you can't grab it, though you can't put clothes on your soul, uh, you know, on your soul, you know, put makeup on it and, or, or, or put perfume on it, it is priceless. You cannot put a value on your soul because it is from God. Thank you. And when something is given you directly from God, doesn't that elevate the value of it? Our life has value because it was given to us of God. Your soul has value, even more so than your flesh, because our flesh is only temporary. But our soul is eternal. I have a question for us. So... Me saying that about my dad, I have two other items that I kind of hold sentimental value. It may seem kind of silly, but my sister got me years ago a little nightlight of Jesus knocking at the door. You ever see pictures of Jesus knocking? It's, a, it's about that high, and, and I turn it on all the time. And 
I have learned to develop sentimental value behind that. My sister gave it to me, but it's, it's Jesus knocking at the door. And, and, and sometimes when I'm just like, just like, blah, it's like life's not doing good, I'll just go over there and turn the light on, Jesus knocking at the door. And then, just, and then many of you know I've made many trips to um, the island of Haiti. Uh, along with Pastor Thomas, you know, and, and Pastor Wells, and many here, uh, uh, that's your um, uh, your nationality, your home country. I made many trips there, and during those trips, I I bought during one of those uh, trips, I bought a, a little wooden, um, uh, not a statue, but a, um, a work of art, and it has uh, where it has a Haitian with the carts that they pull, with stacked up with different stuff on it, and, and it's. It's nice and it's beautiful. I got that on my coffee table. It's been there for years. That has sentimental value to me. I'm just not going to give that away. Someone might ask me money for it, but I'm not going to take it because it, mean, it, it means something to me because of the mem memories and, and being there and being a part of you know, the One Hope for Haiti team. So I was saying that, is there anybody here, this is where you get the interaction, is there anything here this morning that you may have, this is where you may get to just say it, that has some sentimental value to you that you say this is has some value and I'm, I'm not going to give it away. Dave, come on up. Yeah, so you can use a microphone. People will see your lovely face, brother. So just share. I gave uh, Pastor Sonny Tan a wireless mic and then um, year, when he passed away, Larry Glander gave me the mic. I use that on Wednesday nights. I've been using that mic everywhere I go. Thank you. How about that? A mic! A mic, and it means something to him. Uh, Jay. Yeah, I have a lot of uh, scroll work that uh, scroll saw work that my dad made, and one thing in particular is a uh, about a four foot half dome uh, um, clock. In West, it's made in a model of a Westminster Abbey, and it's pretty precious to me because he put lots of hours into it, and he also did a uh, Lord's Prayer, um, same, same same thing on the wall, and you know. Those two things are very valuable to me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You getting it? Paul, come on up. This is part of the message. This is what we hear. This is what God uh, is doing for people here. My, my grandmother made her living as an artist, and she was on in her years, and there was a chance to get just one of her paintings. I didn't have anything that she's done. I didn't get the one I wanted, but I got this one that still hangs in the house today, and this is just a memory because this is what I, when I look at it, I think about my grandmother and uh, what she did and her passion for art. So you're getting it? Pastor Thomas. My great grandfather in the 1800s was a coal miner, and I have his coal mining lamp that he would take into the mine that would warn him about the gas. I also have my grandfather's watch from um, First World War. They called them trench watches, and uh, and I have both of those on display. And they're not leaving our family. Main scripture for today. You put it up. Mark chapter eight, thirty-six to thirty-eight. For what shall a profit a man? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Are you ashamed of the things that we just talked that you just talked about that mean value to you? No, you're not. You're not ashamed of them. They mean because they're precious to you. How valuable? I have some questions now, some comparisons. How valuable is your soul to you? I'm going to keep hearing that over. How valuable is your soul to you? Is it worth a job? We're going to take our time this morning. Is it worth a job. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Everybody has a job. Is it worth a job? Yeah, I got a job. I want to use another example this morning. I called this brother. 
while I was preparing this message. Many of you know him, Chris LeBessier. I said, and he was still working when I called him that evening. I said, Chris, I said, I've tracked you through your career in the military. He was an enlistee. He became an officer. He's been in ministry many years. We grew up together in ministry. And, and, and I said, you know what? You've always impressed me. I, I said, because uh, you're very successful in your military career. He's a, he was enlisted. He came over to be an officer. Now he's a commander. And he's acting as a, com- as a captain, as a leader in position now. And, and I said, you know what? I said, no matter where you've gone, you found a way to plug in with ministry. And that, I said, that always impressed me. He, he's been around the world, but he's found a way to connect in with ministry. And he so graciously said, thank you. You know, he says, but there's so many more good examples on a ministry that have done likewise. That have, they have a job, but they find a way to give glory to God in it. You know what? And Pastor Thomas can say amen and agree to this. And many in here. We've had many to say, I'm going after my dream job. And guess what? They got their dream job. And it was somewhere way, way far away. And then they would say, Pastor, I'm going to come back on the weekends and worship. And I'm going to make my way back and I'll be in church so you'll see me. And for the first couple months, they do so. But then slowly, you see less of them. And then, and then uh, that every week turns into two weeks, and then turns into three weeks, and then it turns into a month, and then all oh, suddenly it's like, poof, you don't see him no more. Now, you, I want to remind us of Brother Paul Von Ponge back there. You just say hi. That brother's going all the way around, halfway around the world. Where you see him at this morning? You see him in church. Guess what he's going to be doing this Wednesday? He's going to be teaching this Wednesday. He's going to be a boss. So won't you, won't you come and, and to encourage him? That he's come all the way on the other side of the world, come here to fellowship and worship and give him study. Why don't you come out and encourage him? You think he'd like to uh, have uh, a crowd of people to uh, share what God has impressed upon your life? Exactly. Is it worth a relationship? These, we are in the days and times where it just doesn't matter anymore. You go out and just find your spouse anywhere you want to, wherever you like. Hmm? Many of you like to throw stones and say, you know, at me. Uh, that's okay, I got my armor on. Uh, I got more than my armor on, on, I got my armor of righteousness on. Get a spouse. Amen. Fall in love. Amen. Have a family. Amen. Just do it in Jesus. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Am I saying anything that's not gospel? Huh? Am I just saying go go out and just go to the club and get your spouse? No, I'm not saying that. Honor Jesus in doing it. Is it worth your physical physique? Many of you know, in my earlier days, my prime, I liked the gym. I worked out. I had my six-pack. I had my muscles. I would wear, many of you saying, yeah, that was you, Pastor. I, I, I made sure I wore tighter shirts so you could see all my muscles. Uh-huh. Yeah. That was Pastor Jeff. I'd stand up in the back and just... You know, make sure that everybody saw I worked out, you know, get that, get that workout right before church so your muscles are nice big. That was me. I read an article one time. I like reading um, bodybuilder um, articles because I, I was just I always just exercising in the gym. And, and so I, I remember this. I, I can't even remember his name, but he was a bodybuilder. He was at the end of his career. And, and he won a competition. And they give him this humongous trophy. It was like as tall as him. (laughs) 
And he couldn't even lift it up. It was so heavy. And him being a bodybuilder. But he says, what always stuck in my mind when I read that article, and he says, I felt so vain. He felt so vain. His endeavor that he endeavored in in life and strove for caused him to feel so vain in life. We're talking about non-negotiables in our Christian faith. Are these some of your non-negotiables that you're going to honor God in, in how you get your spouse? You're going to honor God in making sure that your body is, is in a way that you're not just forgetting about God. I was Med Cruz, young man just got saved. I was heading, uh, when I say passageway, you know in the military what I'm talking about on the ship. And I was heading to Bible study, and one of the young gentlemen just got saved. He was heading the other way, and I said, hey, we're having Bible study. He says, uh, I don't think I'm going to work out my spiritual man this cruise. I said, what a shame. You know what I mean? Exchanging your body for your soul, the physique of it. Oh, a lot more I can get in there. Time is already running out. This is my point. If you lift these things up, above, beyond in Jesus Christ, church, you made the purchase for your soul. You've made the purchase. If you lift those things up and above Jesus Christ. This is what I want the church to do. Allow your identity to be first in Christ. This is what we need to do. Yes, I'm a, I'm, I'm a maintenance worker, but I'm a Christian first. I'm a pastor, but I'm a Christian first. huh? Do I need to say that one? Yeah, I think I need to say that one. A lot of pastors on, uh, aren't Christians, really? Yeah, that's right. Whatever you are in your field, that's what you identify at work, but what are you first? What, what are you first, church? Christian, believer in God. Don't let your soul be auctioned off. Don't let it be that stamp on it sold to the highest bidder. Yes, sir. Keep it with all diligence. And this is what I've learned in life. That it's hard for Satan to persuade a heart that's always being nourished from the hand of God. Amen? When your soul is nourished from the hand of God, when you're studying and, you're, and when your mind is in the Scriptures, when your life is in fellowship and when your uh, work is about the Lord's work, it's going to be really hard for the devil to persuade your mind and heart because you're being nourished from the hand of God. Amen? And when the devil comes in and he begins to negotiate with you, understand this. His negotiation is for one thing, your soul. His aim, his object of desire is to bring down your soul and to destroy your soul. And the only way we're going to head that off, church, is to make sure that our object of desire is Jesus first. That's the only way we're going to head it off, is that our object of desire, we all have that object of desire, and it has to be Jesus Christ. It has to, heaven has to be our goal. It has to be our goal in life. Psalms 27, verse 4. I love what David said here. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Oh, hallelujah. Is that not beautiful? Does that not go and tell you what the object of David's desire was? He's also teaching us really one of the concepts here of non-negotiable, that we have to worship God and not your comfort zone. We have to worship God and not our comfort zone. You know what? We all operate in some sort of safety and familiarity, do we not? And with security. We all like that. We all like when we 
can feel that we have it under control and we feel safe, and, and, and rightly so. And, you know, and, and I think about um, <clears throat> boundaries, how that we have to break through boundaries in life. You, you, everybody knows you have to break through boundaries in life? That is why teachers and coaches are so important in life. I know, Mark, you, you've been a coach in, in several things. In, in because what a teacher and what coaches do is they help you break through barriers. They help you. Say, it's like, I, I don't know if I can do this. The, the baseball coach teaches the, the player that he can hit that ball further. The, the swim coach teaches the athlete that he can swim faster in life. The, the uh, teacher who teaches that kid is like, yes, you can understand this English that you're having so hard time with. They help us break through those barriers. And Jesus Christ is here today to say, um, He's here to help us break through those boundaries that we have in life. He's here to help us break through them, church. He's here to help us to get to the mark of the high calling. And so we need to learn to worship God outside our comfort zone in life. If that's not on one of your list, please put it on there. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Hallelujah. And despising the shame and to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is looking for a church that no matter how much mud the world throws at you, Whatever the flavor of the temptation, you're not going to compromise. You're going to stand, and you're going to stand firm on the gospel, and you said, I'm not going to compromise. That's going to be my non-negotiable. That when the storm comes, God, I'm going to stand in you. Let me share with you some of the interactions of how we should be dialoguing with the devil. Really? Really? We're going to learn. It's like, I need to be dialoguing and interacting with the devil. Remember, this is about non-negotiables. And who's the one that's going to try to uh, uh, come into negotiations and destroy your soul? Who's that going to be? Yeah. So I think we need to find out how we need to interact and dialogue with the devil. Wow, I never heard that before, Pastor. Well, yeah, well, let's get started. James 4.7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist who? How about that? And he will flee from you. You've got to resist and you've got to fight back on the devil. You've got to, church. But you're not going to do it on your own power. You're going to do it with the power of the Holy Ghost. So the question is, how much power of the Holy Ghost do you have in your life? Okay, we need to ask ourselves that. How much of the power? Do we have enough power to, to say... Satan, I'm resisting you today. Do we have that power? See, we're not using swords and guns. We're not using nunchucks. I think that's what you call them, isn't it? We're not using bamboo poles. We're using the power of the Holy Ghost. We're using the armor of the righteousness of God to be able to accomplish this. Understand that. And you're not a doormat for the devil. Can you say, I'm not a doormat for the devil? I'm not a for the devil. Amen. You have to withstand to the point of being undamaged spiritually. You have to understand when that storm comes, when that trial comes, when the temptation hits, you are standing undamaged spiritually. You ever see a storm tear some stuff up? Yeah, you ever see how a hurt, uh, what a t uh, tornado comes through and they have a video of it and just rips it apart? Well, I'm thinking by now you've hit some pretty big storms. Devil's brought some pretty, uh, pretty big storms your way in life. You say, well, I'm young, Pastor. Well, then just hold on to your britches because they're coming. Okay. Hold on, they're coming. And what you put in your life now and how you build the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost in your life now, is going to determine whether you're going to stand or you're going to, I say, withstand the storm. You know, 
um, I've experienced this, and, and I'm sure some of you, it's a whole lot easier to resist sweets when you just eat healthy. Uh -huh. So I remember, we're getting ready to have a fast again this year. We're, we're kind of mixing it up, and we'll talk more about that at our, our, our first church meeting. But the last fast we had, I, I um, my custom was to say, okay, I want to support it, so I would eat in the evening. So I would fast during the day, and I would eat in the evening. Now, you think I'm going to break my fast and eat a chocolate donut and a candy bar? Is that how you want to break your fast? Is that unhealthy? Is that, like, not smart? No, it's not. So you, you get wise and you say, okay, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm, I'm not going to, this is what I want to do, so I'm not going to eat unhealthy because I don't want to damage my flesh. You know, but does, that, does that make sense? So here we are. Saying that Jesus, I'm going to allow you to feed me with healthy stuff. I'm not going to go through this life and not allow myself to be fed with that which is healthy and that which is spiritually. Zechariah. 3, 2. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee. O Satan, even the Lord that hath made uh, chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. This is how we need to be interacting and dialoguing with the devil. When he comes to you, you need to learn to rebuke him. You need to learn, you know what? What you need to be doing is uh, not waiting for him to pack his bags. You need to be packing Satan's bags yourself already and tell him it's time to hit the road. Okay? Don't wait for him to pack his bags and say, I, what are you doing? I said, I'm packing your bags for you because you need to go. Okay? And I'm rebuking you. I need to get out. Did not Jesus teach us that? Did not disciples do that? But how much are we doing that today, actually? How much are we dialoguing and telling the devil that you need to pack your bags and go. Or, matter of fact, I'm packing your bags and, and rebuking the devil. I'm going to bring that thought together here for us. Because Satan, he's a schemer. Got all kinds of elaborate uh, uh, schemes out there to bring you down. And see, and this is how you show your disapproval of what Satan's trying to do in your life is by rebuking him. I don't like what you're trying to do. So, devil... I'm rebuking you in Jesus. And whose name? Jesus. Amen. This is what I was trying to go. We're not talking about, I'm not talking about a video game here. We're not playing a video game, church. This is real life. This is a real war with a real deceptive foe. And he's trying to disrupt your spiritual momentum. It, 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 everybody knows a team that has a momentum is most likely going to what? They're most likely going to win. You can have all the talent on the other side, but if you got the momentum, most likely you're going to win. See, Satan is trying to disrupt your mo spiritual momentum. And, and, and you got to be determined and say, well, how they teach this in sports. And if you have a smaller guy on a team and, he, and he's running up against a bigger guy on the line, what does the coaches teach? They teach him that. That's why you always see a lot of these small guys that's big. They give him the ball because they're down low. And the faster you run, and the lower you are, you may be a smaller mass, but you're going to punch through that line. It's a law. It works. Okay? And they teach that in sports when they're playing. They get those, that ball to that small guy, and the ones that got legs as big as your, you know, your, your stomach, and, and he just runs fast and hard and punches through that line. And see, we, we have to learn to do that spiritually. We have to learn that when Satan starts trying to disrupt us, we we got to get the Holy Ghost, we've got to get low, and we've got to run fast, and we just got to punch through that line and get to the victory and get to the goal and score some points and be a winner in Jesus Christ. Let's go on. He's trying to fill your mind with all kinds of nonsense. Nonsense. Don't make sense. Don't matter. Trivia of the world. Trying to get you to blame God for all of our problems. And most likely, some of the problems that we created ourselves. But yet, it's God's fault. That's what he's trying to do. Uh, would I say he's trying to get you to gossip? 
Mm. You see how he's trying to disrupt? You see how he starts to negotiate with you on all these topics of life? And, and, and if you're not a good negotiator, you, you're going you're to get ripped off. You ever feel like, I, I, I'm not going to say I don't want you to confess, you ever feel like you got ripped off? You buy something, get it home, and, and then it's just broken. It's like, man, I just got ripped off. Mm. He'll try to fill your mind with excuses of why you can't serve in church. I'm, I'm here to tell you now, these seats should be filled. This, uh, we, matter of fact, we should be trying to figure out how to buy more chairs. We, we should have more people on the, uh, around the wall. We should have more kids in the classroom. We should have more teams. We should, how many agrees with me? We should. And honestly, I don't think it's not because we're not inviting. I, I, I'm not saying bad or it's all your fault. No, I think we're inviting people. Who's inviting people to church? Yeah, yeah. We're doing that. For some reason, as Brother Phil so eloquent share with this, people not fearing God this day. But don't let that stop you. Are you letting the devil beat you up? Well, my first answer, somebody asked me that, is I'm going to say no, I'm not. But I want to bring a point to us. If our responses against Satan, attacks, or are irregular, they're, uh, what I say, relaxed or unconcerned, uh, that answer might be yes. You see what, you see what I'm trying to, to share today? You see what God's trying to get us? Uh, understand the gate is non, non-negotiables. But Satan slips in and he begins to negotiate with us some of the, uh, the simplest of small things of our Christian walk and he begins to defeat us. Because we're respond because we're not rebuking the devil. It's because we're not resisting the devil. It's because we're not bringing those thoughts into captivity. That's how we dialogue and interact with the devil. We kick him, we rebuke him, we resist him. Is that your means of negotiating? And I would encourage you to incorporate this posture in your life, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And follow me, my brother. Be strong in the Lord. I'm asking the church to be strong in the Lord today. You want to be strong in the Lord? Then don't cut short on the duties you need to do in the body of Christ. Show up to church. Use your gift. Give. Give until it hurts. Come out early. Leave late. Do something. Bless the church. Put on the whole armor of God. Verse 11. She may be able to stand in the Put on the whole armor of God. For the Bible says we wrestle not against what flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You see what we're wrestling against? Against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore I'll take be able to withstand. Stand, therefore. We don't need to be laying down. We don't need to be crouching down. We need to be standing up. and the helmet of salvation. We need to take these things. God has them for them. We need to take them, and we need to put them on in our life. And this is a fact, that Satan isn't omnipresent. And thank God for that. But this is what you don't know. You don't know when the devil's going to show up. You don't know what corner. The devil's going to show up at school. The devil's going to show up at work. You, you, you're just on your way to you know, a, a dinner out with your family, there it go. The devil shows up. You know, you're on a, a nice drive on your bike. You know, um, um, Harley Davidson, uh, I would suppose, is a good bike. Anybody agree with that? Okay, I thought so. And the devil shows up. You never know where the devil's going to show up. And that's why we need to be walking in the Spirit, church. And that's why we need to be following in steps of the one who's omnipresent. 
the Holy Ghost. Because when the devil shows up, you go, uh, oh, hey, yeah, I want you to meet my friend Jesus. Okay? Yeah, it, it, yeah, we're like tight, man. We're like two peas in a pod. And the devil goes, oh, ooh, uh, I, I tell you what, I'll catch you later. Okay, I'll catch you later. I want you to meet my friend Jesus. I take him everywhere. You know, we was watching a movie, and, and it was about Saul. And it was a, a little line in it was kind of unique. Uh, Saul, he, he was kind of, I guess, kind of a little arrogant. He says, man, a man could do a lot with Jesus on his side. And his friend goes, don't you mean the other way around? Don't, don't, don't we need to be on Jesus' side <laughs> for a lot of things to happen? See, Jesus can't be on your side. You have to be on Jesus' side. That's how it works. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, I already mentioned this one. We have to cast down imaginations and bring in the captivity because the devil is trying to influence your thinking. And he wants you to act impulsively. Is that not shopping? Is that, is that how they get you um, in shopping? You know, you, I, 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 this has happened to me. I've been sitting here watching. I'm watching um, 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 a commercial on, uh, about chicken. The next thing I know, I'm in Popeye's. With Anybody, Anybody with, with me? me? I, like I like Pastor, Pastor Wilson. Wilson. He's, he's with, with me. me. Meet market lovers. Okay, New Jersey. Okay, we got those New Jersey pizzas. You see what the how the devil comes in and tries to influence you? You know, it's like we say, I would never do that. I would never do that. And then the next thing you know, you're it's like, why am I here? Why am I here? Why is this have? Why it's like? Oh no! I just slipped. I just cursed. Really? I just did that. You know, you just, the devil got you so angry. You you hit somebody or shoved them. It's just like it, 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 you was out of character. We got to keep the devil out of our minds, church. But this is what I believe, and I believe it to be true that I'm among those here today. That you're sold out. You're not going to bow. You're not going to bend. You're unchangeable. You're unmovable in Jesus Christ. No matter what the devil throws at you, <clears throat> you've already made up your mind. You've already made up your mind. You know, that's, that's what you have to do. You just have to make up your mind. Because when you make up your mind, you're setting your, you set yourself up for victory. But when you're doubting and, and, and it's just like, and you say, well, you know, you know, maybe, you know, the devil does have something to offer me. You're in for a lot of heartaches. You're in for a lot of what we call at work, slip, trips, and falls. And when you got slip, trips, and falls, there's going to be a lot of injuries going on. I want to remind the church, stay faithful today. And I'm going to end with a little bit about one of the non-negotiables we need to have, another one, is obey God and not your appetite. How would you describe your appetite? Well, you know, you could say, well, are you talking spiritual or natural? You know. Well, on both. How would you describe your appetite? What is there innate things in you that you just have an appetite for? And if it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, if it wasn't for you knowing what saith the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, it is written that the nature of your appetite would have you going a different way. How many could be honest on that? How many you have to fight now? How many have to resist the devil? How many have to rebuke the devil? How many have to bring that thought into captivity because of the nature of your appetite? I have them. Yep, I have them too. Got to fight. Got to resist. How would you describe? I want to share a scripture here. And the scripture helps kind of direct our appetite. In Matthew 6, 19 through 20. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. 
but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. This scripture is really helping us to direct our appetite. It says, lay not up. Where? Stuff here. But we are to lay up what? Our treasures in heaven. So it, it, it helps us guide our appetite, really, in life. And really, this scripture demands a choice from us. What are we going to do? You know what the, uh, the greatest threat to your soul, you know what the greatest threat to your soul is? Anything that takes you away from God. He's like, no, you can't define it to one thing. The greatest threat is whatever is going to take you out. Whatever you're willing to negotiate with. And, and I'll say that, this, that the greatest enemy uh, uh, for not hungering after God isn't necessarily poison, but it's that blackberry cobbler pie with ice cream on it. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. It's not poisoning. It, it, it's, it's not the big sins out there that's getting us. It's that little time that we spend in front of the TV that's just numbing our minds, numbing our hearts, all that little dribble, nibble, and nibbling at the, uh, the world's table. That's what's, that's what's poisoning us. That's what's bringing us down. Many of us know it's just like if Satan come at the front and he's like, hey, you know, do this sin. You're going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. But he comes in the back door. He's sneaky. Because he's after your soul. We're coming to a close here. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God doesn't want us to be deceived. And God is not mocked for whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. You know, this scripture really here, it says, really, what you sow is what you reap. But what happens is, in life, that we try to find this safe middle ground. We try to find a safe middle ground, and we, we make excuses and put off uh, for doing spiritual stuff. We do. But then we still try to deny the flesh. You see what I mean? We're not doing anything for God that we need to be doing, but then we say, well, I'm still going to deny my flesh. What well, Jesus calls that lukewarm. You're not doing anything. You're not going anywhere. The truth is, we all have an appetite for something. And I want to encourage us the hunger and thirst after righteousness. Because if we do that, and then we allow ourselves to be nourished from the hand of God, and we become our brother's and sister's keeper, and we begin to say, you know what, God, I'm not going to negotiate with my time in church. I know that the Bible says that not to forsake the assembly of myself with the body of believers. And I'm not going to do that. And I believe that when I find the church, I know that it's my church, and, and I want to stay here, I know I'm going to give it to that church. I'm going to give them my finances, I'm going to give them my talents. And I believe that there are some here today, you're glad you're here today. And you heard something today that's brought life back into you. You've heard something today that your heart is beginning to beat again. And you say, God, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for somebody reaching out to me and bringing me here. God loves us that much. Church, non-negotiables of our Christian faith. Learn them, study them, and practice them. Because if we do this, and my last scripture is Hebrews 6, 16, and it reads, For men verily swear by the greater, an oath of confirmation is to them the end of all strife. Put your foot down. Draw a line and say, this is it. I'm standing with Jesus over here. And devil, pack your bags. It's time to go. Amen. Amen.